Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for attending the second series of the Chronicles of the Wounds at Sea Investigations webinar series. This is the third and final one in uh, this autumn's uh, series. If you know, please note, if you have any questions throughout this evening's presentations, please use the, the Q&A box and we'll address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. So I am Kath Fergie. I am the current chair of the Wounding Society Education Committee. I'm a, a professor at Case Western Reserve University and a research career scientist at the Cleveland VA. Uh, my role here is to introduce you to our great speakers and moderator. And so I will hand you over to Leticia. Good evening, I'm Leticia Graves and I will be your moderator for tonight's webinar. Um, as Dr. Bogey mentioned, please um, make sure that you're placing your questions in the Q&A and we'll be sure to address those um, at the conclusion of our speaker presentation. So tonight we will have Liz Friedrich and Dr. Alan Zagorin discussing supplemental nutrition. And I will turn it over to um, Dr. Zagorin to get us started. Thanks, Leticia, and welcome. Uh, to everybody, and I hope that this evening's uh, webinar will provide all of those in attendance with uh, some insights uh, to the new role that, new, or the recognized new role that nutrition has with regard to uh, our wounds. As we all know, we all deal with uh, chronic wounds more than acute wounds, and most of the information, unfortunately, that we are going to be telling you uh, has to do with chronic wounds because, or excuse me, with acute wounds, because acute wounds is where the research has been done. The good news is over the last couple of years and moving forward, much more research and more robust research should be done on the uh, on acute wounds, leading to chronic wounds research as well. Um, I'm going to turn my PowerPoint on here. I'm going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then Liz is going to come on and talk about the more practical things. Uh, my role uh, is to uh, actually sort of set the stage with regard to nutrient uh, components and their impact on wound healing. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, a uh, board certified general trauma surgeon. I just retired uh, about three months ago from my role as the medical director for the wound healing program for Unity Point Health System in Iowa. Uh, as well as become an emeritus professor from Drake University and Des Moines University, uh, and literally, literally just moved to the East Coast back to the ocean. I'm actually speaking to you from New York, where I actually did teach today uh, a, a, a group of people with regard to wound healing. So let me get the uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully I can get this done correctly. Um, I got to turn my share screen on. And then I got to turn that on. And then I got to share it. And then I have to do that. And hopefully that worked. Ah, is it working? I believe it is. Okay. So let's talk about nutrition, metabolism, and wound healing. Uh, most of it's old and some of it's new. And hopefully uh, at the end of my talk, we will have at least some insights with regard to the components of nutrition and where they are um, highlighted within wound healing. Unfortunately, some of this is a bit of an enigma, and we're beginning to just learn the various nuances with regard to where the impact is with regard to nutrition deficiencies and chronic wounds. We know a fair amount of, about it with regard to acute wounds, but as far as chronic wounds, uh, that's been a little bit lagging. And the lag is mostly because of the lack of funding uh, the lack of uh, the excitement with regard to wounds in general, but certainly a lack of funding for research. And so if, for those of you who are out there who are researchers, this is an area that is woefully underserved. And um, as a um, emeritus, um, somebody that's leaving this, uh, this uh, area, at least in terms of acutely, uh, I encourage you to start looking at some of these questions that will arise with regard to the impact that uh, nutrition has on the evolving necrotic wound, or excuse me, on the evolving chronic wound. As I said, I just finished speaking for about six hours about wounds. So I may, may go back into that discussion. Anyway, some relevant disclosure, disclosures here on the screen. 
nothing that will impact anything that I say. Um, as we all know, metabolic needs are basic to all human physiologic processes and wound healing and regeneration of skin and tissue is no different. Uh, as I alluded to, the majority of the information that we already have in terms of the impact of nutrition on chronic wounds is really uh, extrapolated from that which we know about acute wounds. Most of the recent chronic wound research is, that, is very much that and really just scratching the surface. Uh, as we go forward, we should be learning more. There does seem to be a nutri nutrition disconnect in the chronic wound patients affecting all chronic wound patients. And again, because the majority of chronic wound patients tend to have other significant comorbidities, it's a little bit more complex than just simply uh, nutrition defect leading to chronic wounds because there's a, a, a woven, a significant web that is woven with regard to all of these comorbidities and how nutrition plays a role in them. Things such as diabetes and hypertension, lipid disorders, uh, aging, the aging process itself. So because of that, and because the definitive research is sparse, you have to extrapolate what we know about acute wounds, bring it forward into chronic wounds in, in sort of a logical focus. More than likely, most chronic wounds that we deal with are not nutritionally developed, but certainly nutrition will have an impact on the healing and the regeneration of tissue as we go forward. <clears throat> there are nutrition recreated defects that we know that create wounds such as scurvy and other inborn errors of metabolism, uh, but those are not things that we typically see now and, and uh, they just give us information and insight. There's recent data about the importance of arginine and glutamine, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit with regard to their impact on wound healing and especially where they may impact chronic wounds. Much of our benchmark data for nutrition intervention comes from traumatic wounds and also on disease specific research such as diabetes, lipid metabolism, uh, et cetera. Uh, so as I said, the current knowledge is somewhat inferred from the, uh, the, the data that we have and also from burn, it, burn therapy and burn treatment as well. We have a lot of information nutritionally with regard to its impact on burns and critical injury. Um, so this discussion will extrapolate. It stems mostly from the relationship of the visceral redistribution of nutrient substrate to the adaptation to heal wounds as a result of acute injury. We also know that the stress response utilizes skeletal muscle mass to supply metabolic requirements for wound healing and tissue regeneration. What the role is of that with regard to chronic wounds is still somewhat obscure, but certainly comes into focus when we think about what is required in a chronic wound to move it from chronicity to regeneration and healing. We know, for example, that arginine is very important in the production of hydroxyproline and in arginine uh, pathways, hydroxyproline levels can be enhanced when we supplement with some arginine. Now, when, as when we get into the microcosm and the microbiome of the wound, what that effect is and how much and how little in the chronic wound uh, with assay uh, data, we don't have yet, but that assay data is now developed and we will see more of that as we move forward because we'll be able to assay what's happening in the microenvironment of the wound. We know that glutamine, for example, is very important in terms of the development of T cells and their adaptation. Uh, T cell and uh, lymphatic uh, issues with regard to chronic wounds um, are uh, probably, not, uh, probably not part of the cause, but certainly may be part of the solution. Uh, we also need to discover what the macronutrient effect and interaction are with regard to the micronutrients, especially when they may or may not be deficient in chronic wounds. I'm going to talk a little bit about other things such as carbohydrate, lipids, trace elements, vitamins, and minerals. Time is limited, and so I'm going to sort of just go over them in general uh, without getting too much in the weeds. To remind everybody, certain amino acids, especially uh, those that are uh, need to be created are essential, so they must be included in the diet and they're not created. I might also remind everybody that glutamine and arginine 
are prevalent. They're actually the most common amino acids that are available. There's a reason for that, and that has to do with their importance with regard to many physiologic events, and especially with regard to tissue regeneration and stability. The cellular energy comes from circulating glucose, fatty acids, cholesterol, beta oxygen for ATP, as well as inclusion into cellular membranes. Macro minerals, uh, which are located in things such as the bone and fat, are indispensable, but some are, some are indispensable and must be ingested, uh, and some are stored. Metabolic stress alters the utilization of all nutrients, and depending upon the impact of the metabolic stress, especially in the background, uh, where the background is these significant comorbidities that we see in our patients that are chronically, uh, they're chronically wounded, uh, we wind up having to have uh, some muddy water with regard to how all of this interacts. Each chronic wound patient is a microcosm in unto themselves, especially because of the interaction of the significant comorbidities, as well as the etiology of the wound itself, which can go across various uh, various uh, strata, whether it be a diabetic wound, venous ulcer, uh, uh, arterial wound, and so on. And some have multiple wounds uh, with multiple comorbidities and the nutrition uh, impact on those, again, is uh, probably uh, much more complex than readily observed. Uh, obviously, providing optimal nutrition is dynamic and multifactorial in addressing these needs. Uh, stress response will alter the transfer of metabolic needs based on predetermined physiologic needs. Obligate tissue glucose metabolism is required by obligate tissue, uh, obligate glucose metabolic cells. Uh, and so we exclude glucose from some of the tissue regeneration uh, when severe stress is occurring. Uh, and because of that, we wind up having to take some of the amino acid pool and use those as energy sources. What that role is in chronic wounds is yet to be understood. Uh, in general, malnutrition consists both of over and under or mismatched nutrition. Again, something that's not readily, un readily um, accepted or not accepted, but readily um, understood by, the, by, by general practitioners in medicine. Uh, Overnutrition is just as bad as undernutrition and a good significant, and a significant number of chronic wounded patients are, um, have over uh, over overburdened stores of fat, et cetera, with an under uh, predisposed store of lean body mass. There's research that supports about 10% of older patients show some statistical form of malnutrition. Now, whether that's part of the aging process or simply a precursor to the chronic wounds, we don't know, but we do know that um, this data is in older patients is pretty much obligate. And because 10% uh, of the older population extrapolated tends to have some form of malnutrition that probably does play a role in chronicity. Um, this data comes from uh, uh, data that says that about 60% of institutionalized patients, 85% of patients in nursing homes also show some form of malnutrition um, and African-American elderly, uh, elderly are highest uh, in this in terms of about 38.6% of the population extrapolated. And so minorities tend to be greater across the board in terms of their risk. Now, age and associated factors place elderly populations at greater risk as I've said, and potentially socioeconomically depressed populations as well, especially in those populations where there's an altered taste of mobility, an altered taste, uh, an altered presence of detention, uh, a dentition, excuse me, uh, as well as um, the simple uh, socioeconomic problems associated with obtaining appropriate levels of protein uh, and uh, increased levels of uh, carbohydrate as caloric sources. Uh, we have age-associated appetite uh, depression, which creates decreased nutrient intake, patients, pa places patients at risk without supplementation, which increases if a chronic non wheat healing wound is present simply because the wound is there, which increases metabolic stress and will lose protein in and of itself. Chronically used medications are again, uh, well over 250 can alter appetite, taste, digestive effectiveness, and they interact with each other. And again, this will probably play a role as we move further in our investigation of chronicity. Pain itself, in, in, uh, whether related to the wound or other comorbidities, 
leads to anorexia and chronic pain has a significant impact on nutrition intake. We also know that there are basically three varieties of protein calorie malnutrition. They are marasmus quashiorcor or marasmic quashiorcor. Whoops, there we go. Somehow I got muted. Um, go back there. Uh, marasmus is the decrease of fat stores relative to muscle mass with an inadequate nutrition intake uh, with a concomitant body wasting and a normal visceral organ function. Screening labs and that can be normal. So unfortunately, we may not pick that up uh, in the acute phase of the, of the patient. Quachiorcor is an inadequate amount of protein intake, uh, potentially creating peripheral edema, decreased uh, circulating serum albumin, which of course is not a good nutrition screen, but because there's an alteration there, it will change the way in which fluids are exchanged. And in chronic wounds, edema is a significant uh, comorbidity. And then we have marasmic quashiorcor, <clears throat> which of course is a combination of those, but increased the caloric availability with a loss of protein stores. <clears throat> and all these things will impact wound healing and either create a wound or impact the healing to various degrees. Open wounds increase metabolic stress and nutrient needs, uh, partially because of need, needs for increased protein requirements and probably caloric requirement as well. And larger wounds, especially with deep tissue loss, increased protein loss and subsequent protein requirements. A pressure injury can encompass five to 10% of the body surface area. And obviously that will increase protein loss in and of itself. Lean body mass replacement, Requi uh, requirements along with the wound can increase protein needs upwards of 25 to 250% and caloric needs by 50%, especially when we're, we're dealing with patients with chronic wounds that are uh, large and, and the chronicity is over a long period of time. Loss of lean body mass with inadequate protein intake leads to degradation of the skeletal muscle mass and visceral proteins may be transformed, such as uh, the alanine shunt in the liver contributing to lean body mass and poor healing. One of the, uh, the uh, caveats is that up to 20% of uh, lean body mass loss will impair immunity uh, and wound healing will still take precedence over lean body mass restoration, uh, even up till about 20% loss of lean body mass. Once we get greater than that though, the loss of lean body mass will impact, impact and reduce the shunting of protein for wound healing and that will shunt it back to lean body mass and shunt away from the improvement or the increase to regenerate new tissue in the, in the wound and chronicity it becomes impacted there. Greater than 40% lean body mass loss will ultimately lead to death if not very quickly corrected. Protein loss will affect all four stages of wound, he wound healing uh, and can affect whether or not uh, hemostasis occurs appropriately, the proliferative phase, and the obviously regeneration uh, and um, the various uh, alterations in terms of the development of epithelium going forward. There are most, con most common under assumptions amongst humans, uh, vitamin D, zinc, and vitamin B12. We know that there's somewhat of a sustained underconsumption of fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and A, D, E, and K will alter wound healing, especially uh, A and E. Uh, and D in terms of wound repair, especially in bony prominences and so on. They also affect uh, in the microcosm uh, and the microbiome in terms of the way in which various uh, chemical transporters are moving and are recognized. Water-soluble vitamins, as we all know, are not stored and require constant replenishment. And if we look at the chronic wound patient, especially the elderly population, where intake may be varied and altered, this is problematic. Zinc reduction impairs immune function. Excess intake, by the way, has significant negative consequences. So we need to be careful with regard to uh, when we supplement it, which will be talked about by Liz, uh, but certainly it is impacts cross-linking with regard to uh, collagen deposition. Uh, and when there's a nutritional uh, impact or zinc has that kind of nutrition impact on wound regeneration. Vitamin D deficiency, as we know, has an, we have increased data that it's being 
uh, its deficiency is quite widespread. And that can lead to multiple wound healing delays, especially in terms of the degradation or the in integrity of epithelial barriers. And it impacts venous uh, ulcer repair and pressure injury repair. Chronic wounds offer a variability and complexity that for the, especially for the researcher is not overwhelming, but certainly daunting. Vascular associated wounds uh, are a little more simplistic, but again, what the role of nutrition is with regard to vascular associated wounds on the chronic stage, uh, will will deal with things such as hemoglobin formation, oxygen and car carbon dioxide transport. Um, our role in dealing with pressure injuries to prevent and remove the pressure, but what the role is of nutrition is somewhat understood or somewhat misunderstood, but we're learning more in that area than any place else. Again, neuropathic ulcers uh, are ulcers that we need to uh, have a further understanding and nutrition alterations are common in all. So nutrition alterations can and will affect wound healing. Uh, that's a physiologic absolute. As we look at the macronutrition, we do have some data with regard to wound healing and especially in terms of chronic wounds. Total, in all cases, total energy needs must be met. Uh, there's a little debate about the absolute of what the energy needs are, especially in the patient with a chronic wound. Somewhere between 30 and 35 kilocalories, up to 40 uh, as per the NPI, uh, IAP, probably owing in the NPIAP data uh, because of those patients having larger pressure injury with more tissue loss. We know that 40 to 60 percent of carbs uh, 25 to 30% of fats and 12 to 15% of protein must be ingested as part of the normal diet. Approximately one to 20 grams per one to two grams per kilogram uh, protein meat is required to have wounds heal. Um, AHRQ uh, review reveals probably a little higher at about 1.25 to 1.5, and certainly it's greater in burn patients. So caloric needs need to be adequate, and caloric improvement and maintaining the caloric needs in patients with chronic wounds can spare catabolic reduction of lean body mass. However, if we have an aging population that already is at risk and is already showing some reduction in total nutrition status, uh, new, the lean body mass catabolism perhaps has already begun. More specifically, if we look in arginine, which is a conditionally essential amino acid, which is derived from citrulline, it it is a very important in terms of the development of regeneration. It's a precursor to proline. It's a precursor to proline, nitric oxide. It stimulates growth hormone. And because of that, obviously has some effect on uh, wound healing. Some research supports increased supplementation of arginine uh, will be operative in terms of improving this, uh, but it's limited. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid, as we all know. It's conditionally essential in stress. It can be used as a direct energy source in stress by neutrophils. Obviously, in terms of the inflammatory phase of wound healing, neutrophils are extremely important. Uh, and if neutrophil, uh, neutrophils are uh, dysfunctional or redu reduced in volume, uh, this might affect uh, slow new, the slow uptake of inflammatory response which therefore could lead to chronicity. Now, whether that's really going on is something that we are just beginning to learn and certainly may show promise going forward. Glut glutamine is a precursor to glutathione and glutathione helps cell membrane stabilization. Uh, alpha, uh, vitamin A transport, it's an enzyme cofactor. And again, in terms of regeneration with regard to epithelium and keratinocytes, it probably plays a very big role. The data is unclear, but the logic says that chronic malnutrition patients have adaptive reduction and are not necessarily hypermetabolic, uh, but may in fact have an issue uh, with regard to uh, stabilization of these and other uh, meta micro microscopic nutrients. Uh, supplement supplementation alone appears not to be a substitute for establishing a stable nutrition and halting PCM. So supplementation over and above the normal daily requirements might be important. Uh, it's observably important and makes sense, but how much and where and so on is still somewhat um, 
of a little bit of a, of a confusion or a conundrum. Right now, there's about 39 different studies. They are somewhat lim limited, as I mentioned, with acute injury with regarding the current understanding of uh, arginine glutamine and their role with regard to wound healing. Oral arginine's half-life half -life is limited and what, that, what the role is of that with regard to going forward to uh, stabilization of collagen production is unknown. Uh, supplementing with either of them can positively influence wound healing or parameters directly related to wound healing. Uh, reducing length of stay, we, we've, we've got data that shows supplementation with each, each of these amino acids can reduce uh, length of stay in acute injury and overall mortality. But again, in chronic wounding, we're not really sure. It, by, by convention, it would make sense. Um, fats are an integral and essential component of normal metabolism and structural repair. Essential fatty acids, again, just like the essential amino acids must be injected. Uh, we do know that there is wounding as a result of their diminishment or, or their, their lack of intake, but what the role is with regard to supplementation, we don't have significant uh, information there. Besides energy from metabolic work, they also affect as the, the, the stabilization of membranes, uh, they will affect the production of substances like prostaglandins, thromboxanes, leukotrienes, uh, and therefore are operative in terms of the wound healing cascade in the microbiome, but to what extent and whether or not they are absent or in diminished amounts, we're not exactly sure as of yet. And fats will affect or can by logic affect the later stages of inflammatory response and therefore affect the stages of wound healing. Uh, by altering or potentially altering inflammatory response. Now, whether or not a diminished amount of these essential, essential fats uh, in the microbiome are part of the problem with uh, a wound that is stuck in the inflammatory response uh, stage is unknown, but bears further investigation. There is a study that reports uh, enteral formulas enriched with EPA and AC and E have a positive effect on the progression of pressure injury, increasing the uh, trajectory to healing. What that means though in the microcosm is unknown. This is promising data. The micronutrients with regard to antioxidant defense mechanism in terms of things like vitamin E, vitamin C interaction, A and so on is very complex and we don't have time to talk about them all here, but it's very important to understand that because vitamin A, E, selenium, zinc, et cetera, are all so important in terms of the antioxidant defense mechanism, that clearly when there's a deficiency state of these, there may of some, one, or all, that may alter into the wound that becomes chronic. Again, unknown, but some area, that, an area that we need to research. Zinc is active in metalloenzymes, tissue repair, replacement, and growth. But we have to be careful because excess supplementation of zinc can affect other uh, ion absorptions. So zinc levels before supplementation above 40 milligrams should be monitored. We also have data that shows topical application of zinc seems to improve acute wounds. Now, whether that does the same thing in um, chronic wounds is unknown. Uh, there's some uh, minor uh, anecdotal data out there that it has the same effect. Iron is an essential component of hemoglobin. It's obviously, there's, there's a certain logic there. Uh, it's a cofactor essential for collagen synthesis as well as being a carrier for oxygen. What the role is of that going forward uh, and then where that impacts chronic wounds is also needs to be investigated. Deficiency states in altered hemoglobin globin function impairs tissue production and regeneration at all kinds of levels and therefore more than likely uh, will be somewhat problematic in terms of chronicity. We don't uh, necessarily have the time to go into it in depth, but that's another area that bears further research. Ascorbic acid, which, uh, which is vitamin C, is not soared. We know that a deficiency state will create a chronic non-healing wound, as we see in scurvy. Uh, replacing this, this vitamin C will actually help heal those wounds. It's an essential micronutrient in collagen formation and stability. It's stored, it must be uh, ingested. We don't have really good data on vitamin C and chronic wounds, but more than likely there's a significant operative component there as well. Vitamin A, again, fat soluble, essential. Uh, it's a hormone and certain function, functionings, 
stimulating retinoid receptions in the fibroblast. So again, obviously, because it does that in chronicity where there may be fibroblastic diminishment uh, and melanocyte uh, dysfunction, and also in epithelial dysfunction, obviously in chronicity, there may be an operative component of uh, vitamin A uh, deficiency in those areas as well. But we also know that topical effects in the positive realm in acute injury will uh, are seen, and whether or not that's the same in chronic wounds, it still lets to be uh, yet to be still waits to be uh, seen. It also may stimulate TGF beta, and that really will have a significant impact on chronicity. Other things such as thiamine, riboflavin, cobalamin, uh, pradoxine, pantothene, vitamin D, and vitamin E all exert a effect and modulate integrity with regard to regeneration. Vitamin E actually might exert a negative effect on collagen synthesis in ex excessive amounts, antioxidant response, and may counteract vitamin A supplementation and wound banishment. So we have to be careful. And whether or not there's a component of chronicity with regard to that interaction also needs to be investigated. Um, so stable wound healing requires a coordinated dance of multiple biochemical and physiologic events. Chronicity may be a disruption or may have a component of disruption of these events in the microbiome. This is the area that needs to be investigated going further. We're now in the uh, beginning stages of understanding what happens in the micro area uh, of the interaction of all of these biochemical events in the wound. We're beginning to develop assay, <clears throat> the ability to assay the microcosm uh, of the wound environment. Uh, and these biochemical interactions will be better understood as we move forward. I do believe that as we go forward and as we move forward in the research with regard to chronicity and wound healing in general, but chronicity in specifics, we'll begin to, be a, begin to understand what's happening at the biochemical level of cr the chronic wound. The interaction of all of these nutrients will more than likely be a component of that understanding. And as we move forward as a component of that understanding, we should over the course of the future be able to interact with them and perhaps in one way or another, reduce the, the development of chronicity with nutrition impact. Uh, but we always have to remember that most of these wounds are not there because there's a nutrition defect. Nutrition plays a role in the wound healing and the regeneration and what the role is and how that can affect uh, the chronic wound becoming a healed wound still remains to be seen. Chronic wounds are an enigma and recent evidence suggests that a significant number of patients with chronic wounds exhibit these deficiencies. Biochemical assays of the chronic wound will yield new pathways for the clinician to assess biochemical environment of the wound and address it from this respect perspective. Nutritional intervention will, in my prediction, have a prominent place. Whew. Okay, I said my piece. There's a lot of information here. There's a lot of very good uh, papers that sort of bring this into focus, although not do not necessarily uh, cite one specific incident where we can actually purposely impact chronicity. Uh, but th those are the things that we'll see going forward. Uh, I'm, I'm, thanks everybody. Um, I know I spoke, uh, spoke quickly. Uh, I did that on purpose uh, because, uh, whoops, We have a lot to do and a lot to go forward here. Um, now I'm going to introduce Liz, who's going to talk about probably what's more important to most of the people out there, and that is given all that we don't know, what is it that we can do? So um, I'm going to introduce Liz Friedrich. She's up there in the uh, blue shirt. Hi, Liz. You got Hi, the call. Alan. Thank you so much for that great. You really set the stage for what I'm going to talk about really nicely. Um, just a brief introduction. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, uh, live in North Carolina, and I'm a clinician first and foremost. I work in long-term care, but I'm also a writer and a speaker um, on the subjects of wound healing and end-of-life care. I'm nutrition wound care certified, and um, I'm also board certified in geriatric nutrition. So I'm going to uh, speed through here, and um, I can't 
talk about supplemental nutrition without just briefly touching on malnutrition. And of course, we know malnutrition has been associated with wounds um, and with poor wound healing. And hopefully all of you out there um, know that serum albumin and prealbumin are not good indicators of malnutrition. And there's a whole broad school of research out there and lots of debate in the literature about how we can identify malnutrition. Um, and you see on the slide, there's three different things that are really basically used nowadays. One is the Aspen and Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics criteria. One is the Global, Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition or GLIM. And one is the Subjective Global Assessment, which is a nutrition screening tool. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, but the common characteristics that you see in all three of those things I just mentioned um, are unintended weight loss, loss of muscle mass, and reduced food take or uh, food assimilation. So uh, those are three things that we really focus on when we're looking at malnutrition in patients who have acute or chronic wounds. So I really think it's important to recognize that food is medicine. Food is so important. And a lot of times we as clinicians just want to jump to, you know, what kind of vitamin supplement or what kind of nutrition, oral nutrition supplement. But food can and does provide all the nutrients that a body needs to support wound healing. It also, of course, can improve symptoms of diseases and it can promote health and prevent disease. So it is medicine. Um, it's also love. And that's important too, because a lot of times what we think a patient should eat is not in agreement with what they think because they obviously have so many different things that uh, food means. If you'll advance that, Alan, there's some bullet points that'll come up. Thank you so much. Um, there's cultural, social, religious connections to food. There are also, um, Celebration. Food is always something that we think about when we get together to celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, etc. Um, we know that everyone has their favorites, foods, and things they can't live without, myself included. And, you know, I just think it's important to remember that food should be viewed as much more than just nutrition. Um, so just kind of telling you that a little bit um, before we move on. But you know, I'm a firm believer in using food first to support wound healing. I just think that we need to encourage a diet that's high in nutrients. And it's really critically important to remember that it's the synergistic effects of foods and nutrients, not just vitamin A or vitamin C, but the whole diet all together, the protein, the vitamins, the minerals, the calories, the fat, everything. Um, that can help support the, the wound healing. Um, of course, we want to honor cultural and religious food preferences. That's very important. Um, and one thing I think it's easy for a lot of us to forget is we really need to meet the patient where they are, not where we think they should be. Um, people have all kinds of backgrounds and socioeconomic limitations, et cetera, et cetera. And we really have to be where they are. Um, we can fortify foods. A lot of times what we do in long-term care, we give somebody oatmeal that's got a lot of um, extra protein powder or powdered milk or cream to give it more calories and more protein. So that's um, one thing we can do. And then of course, if, if the nutrient intake through food is not appropriate or adequate, we can recommend oral nutrition supplements and we would always go with standard nutrition supplements um, as the first intervention, not the high-tech specialty stuff, but just what you could buy from any um, pharmacy or food service supplier. So what's a healthful eating pattern? Well, there's lots of different quote diets out there. Um, I've got a few listed up there on the screen. Um, all of those are pretty well known by, I think most people who are at, at all involved in um, medicine or nutrition, um, including vegetarian and vegan eating patterns, they can be adequate to support wound healing. But the one template that most of us dietitians tend to use um, is myplate.gov. If you're not familiar with it, with it, I encourage you to go to that website and take a look. If you work with patients at all, they have great handouts there. But basically, if you look at that plate, you see that that's what's recommended for good nutrition. Uh, fruits, vegetables, grains, um, protein, and dairy. So um, 
we've talked about protein, Alan talked about it. I just wanted to reiterate to you where people can get protein in their diet. Um, of course, from animal foods or plant foods, um, your meat, poultry, fish and shellfish, dairy, all great sources of protein. But again, the needs can be met, met through plant foods and the plant foods are listed there. Um, dried beans and peas. Oh, I have eggs under plant foods. That's an error. I apologize. Um, nuts and nut butters, peanut butter, things of that nature. So, you know, sometimes if you need to meet a patient where they are, they might much prefer to eat um, soy foods than they might beef. So you need to be cognizant of that. And then your vitamins and minerals. Well, each food has its own good sources of certain vitamins and minerals, but a good, like, as I mentioned earlier, a good well-balanced diet that contains a lot of fruit, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, um, meat and poultry, dairy and eggs is going to provide a good variety of the vitamins and minerals for the most part that are needed to support wound healing. Now, the kind of the Bible, Alan mentioned, there's not a lot of research out there um, on nutrition and wound healing, and that's absolutely true. And um, one reason for that is it's just so difficult to do nutrition research. You know, you have to rely on people's memories about what they ate, and it, it's very, very complicated. But the Bible for me um, are the, the 19, 2019 um, clinical practice guideline put out by the NPIAP the um, European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel and the Pan Pacific Pressure Injury Alliance. This is produced every five years. So they're already working on the one that will come out in 2024. So a lot of what I'm saying moving forward comes from this guideline. <clears throat> so the title of our presentation is Supplemental Nutrition. So what does the guideline say about that? Well, it says to offer high calorie, high protein nutritional supplements in addition to the usual diet for adults with a pressure injury who are malnourished or at risk of malnutrition if nutritional re requirements cannot be achieved by normal dietary intake. So food first, of course. Um, but what is normal dietary intake? Well, you know, that can vary depending on your perspective, but a good guideline is a person consistently consumes at least half of their meals they consistently consume good sources of protein at meals and or between meals, and they eat a good variety of foods from all the food groups. Now, if you're a clinician or a researcher, you may not really know what the patients that you're working with eat. And so sometimes you have to get into the weeds and ask some questions to really find out if they're eating enough. And there are certainly a lot of nutrition interventions that we use in practice to support wound healing. You see them on the screen, but um, a couple I'm gonna highlight are to individualize a diet. If you have an 84 year old diabetic person, um, it's probably a good idea to just let them eat whatever they want, monitor their sugars, use medicines if necessary, but if they're gonna get more pleasure and eat more nutrients, that's the best way to go. Um, I mentioned fortifying foods earlier, um, modifying the food or beverage consistency if someone has swallowing issues. Um, Alan mentioned looking at the medications, um, add oral nutrition supplements, and one thing, or targeted nutrition therapy, we'll talk about that in a minute. One thing I think is really important for us to remember is there's a lot of resources out there in the community. A lot of people are food insecure in this day and age, and they might just need a program to help them get extra food at the grocery store or participate in a food distribution program. Um, and there's lots of those things out there. You just have to know how to find them. So another thing to think about, this is you know, a clinical standpoint from a hospital or a nursing home, but even for a person who lives in the community, you know, what kinds of foods can, can increase protein intake? You see, um, a commercial shake might have seven grams or other oral nutrition supplements might have up to 30 grams. But look, you can give somebody a sandwich with a couple ounces of meat and get 14 grams. Um, so certain nourish uh, foods, foods and snacks are much higher in protein than others. So that's just kind of an important thing to remember. And by the way, we dietitians have all these calculations we use based on weight to try to figure out exactly how much protein calories and fluid a person needs a day. So, you know, we would look at that information and then recommend uh, supplements or whatnot based on that. 
Now there's a lot of oral nutritional supplements out there if you're gonna use them. Um, homemade supplements, homemade milkshakes, um, fortified ice creams and puddings. They're standard liquid supplements that come in different um, sizes, two ounces, four ounces, eight ounces. Um, and the calorie content and protein content of those things does vary. Um, the, it's important to think about the considerations. You know, it's easy to sit sit there with our prescription pad and say, get this supplement, but people have distinct wants and needs and desires. They might prefer a clear supplement to a creamy one. They might have financial issues and not be able to afford certain things. Um, in a hospital or nursing home, sometimes the shelf stable ones that don't have to be refrigerated are much better to use than um, the ones that you need to keep cold. So there's just a lot of different things to consider before you just say, have a nutrition supplement. But what's really most important, you know, it's the patient's preferences. Can they get it? Is it available? How much does it cost? But what's most important to remember is that, advance please, Alan, the patient must consume the supplement for it to be of benefit. And, you know, I can tell you how many times I have seen supplements sit unopened on a tray in a nursing home. And not only it's not doing them any good, it's costing a lot of money that gets thrown down the garbage can. So what about targeted nutrition therapy? Again, based on the, um, C, uh, the clinical practice guidelines, um, they are recommending, and again, there's limited research out there. This is based on what is out there high calorie, high protein, arginine, zinc, and antioxidant oral supplements or enteral feeding for those with a stage two or greater pressure injury who are malnourished or at risk for malnutrition. Now there's lots of different targeted, well, I call them targeted nutrition therapies out there. Some of the ingredients that you often see are HMB, arginine, collagen, peptides, and L-citrulline and glutamine. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not against them. I'm not necessarily, necessarily for them either. I've seen them work for some people and not for others. So, you know, you can try them, but I certainly wouldn't leave someone on them indefinitely if you're not seeing any improvements. Um, you could, you know, try and see what happens. Now, the manufacturer's websites, I took this information just so you would be able to see what each of those different ingredients claim um, that they can do to help support the wound healing. And I'm not gonna read that slide, but you can see there, they all have um, some level of evidence to support what they say about um, the role of their ingredient in supporting wound healing. So the clinical NPIAP clinical practice guidelines do kind of spell out what you should do for stage one, two, three, and four pressure injuries. And, Alan kind of gave you some of the calories and protein information earlier. Um, the arginine, zinc, and antioxidants, that's all based on one type of supplement that contains all three of those ingredients. And you see there, um, it says consider for at least four weeks. I think I said two to four weeks earlier, but um, you know, you can try it. And again, if it's not working, no improvement noted, stop it. I think that's key for everybody involved. So, you know, my recommendations would be use food, food first. And if you need to add protein, um, add extra servings for somebody who loves their hamburgers, give them another hamburger um, or fortify those foods and monitor their intake. You know, dietitians are big on monitoring and evaluation. You know, we want to be able to see that if they're eating better or eating more that the wound is progressing. And then if necessary, oral nutrition supplements, um, I would always recommend your standard supplement first, and then some of the tar more targeted nutrition therapies, um, if necessary. And again, discontinue if the supplements aren't used or don't appear to be effective. And there we are. I hope there are some questions that we can answer for you. Okay. I'll say thank you so much. Um, that was really exciting information. And I know um, I had a couple of questions. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A box and we can get those um, 
we can get those asked. Um, so I really liked that food is medicine um, concept because I, I totally agree. And I think that we often hear this when we think about food being cultural or a lot of our celebrations and activities being around food. And one thing um, that I, I tend to notice is that we see this more in conversations around complementary and alternative therapies and not necessarily medicine focused or healthcare focused. So my question is, do you see this becoming more of a healthcare focused concept or are we seeing this kind of narrative coming up in uh, medicine? And if not, um, how do we shift the narrative? Alan, you want to start with that? <laughs> Well, actually, that's probably more in your wheelhouse, but but I one of the things that's very important is, and I, and I, Liz and I are actually in the same claim with regard to how do we how do we improve the nutrition of the patient. I have a, a lecture that I use. It's called Eat a Chicken because at the end of the day, that's less expensive and it is an intact protein, and intact protein is the key because it has all the things you need. Um, the problem is that. Even even the supplement uh, schedule that Liz showed, I have a, a little problem with that, especially if you look at the manufacturers. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be gentle. What the manufacturers say that those supplements will do, uh, that's not based on any really uh, robust research. That's based on, I don't say it's hearsay, it's probably anecdotal. And as we all know, nutrition research is problematic in general, specifically because it doesn't bring in a lot of money. And if it doesn't bring in a lot of money, it's very hard to get people to do it. That being said, I think um, we'll learn more uh, going forward if we can do more assay in the uh, wound bed and the wound fluid to identify whether or not we really need arginine more than we normally would, or whether or not glutamine is really going to be uh, important because the lymphocyte, the T lymphocytes aren't functioning in a chronic wound. And the reason they're not functioning is the fact that there's a glutamine disconnect. I'm not so sure that's true, but but we need to know that. Uh, and that's in the microcosm. But more of your question, it's, it's more actually in Liz's wheel, wheelhouse. So I'm going to live. Okay. Um, sadly, I don't see that happening. Um, um, I just don't see it happening. It, at least, you know, I think that's one benefit to the alternative medicine um, community is that there is a more of a focus on it. And, you know, there are a lot of quote unquote fad diets out there that have done a lot to raise awareness about good nutrition overall. But I just think people in general, including uh, scientists and medical practitioners tend to overlook the fact that food food can be medicine. And I'm going to just one other comment is food can also be a problem. And uh, depending upon the, the, uh, the fad that one uh, decides to uh, follow, um, again, this is in, in my lifetime, we had a big issue with regard to liquid amino acid supplements years ago, uh, which didn't contain essential amino acids. And pe people were getting very ill and dying because they were going on diets because it was the fad of the time uh, without any significant controls. And quite frankly, that's problematic in food because the controls are not necessarily done by the FDA. If the, the controls of that is through the USDA and, and, and while they're, they do a good job, and Tom Vilsack's actually a friend of mine, the reality is that's not their role. Their role isn't to decide what is a good um, what, whether or not this is going to work. The, the role of that is really up to us, to the clinicians and the professionals to guide and, and shape the uh, patients going forward uh, and try to dis... Uh, we, we're in the, the world of disinformation. Today is obviously a, a clear example of that. And uh, the patients are getting their information from the internet. And of course, as we all know, if it's on the internet, it must be true. So <laughs> yeah. I'll go, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, Dr. Google is my, <laughs> my aunt calls it. <laughs> um, I'll say, I had another question for you, um, Dr. Zagorin. I'll say, you had mentioned in one of your slides that minorities tend to be at greater risk um, for chronic wounds or malnutrition um, driven 
chronic wounds or something along those lines. I might not have that correct. But um, oh, one of correct. the things I was thinking or what that I was interested <clears throat> in, what do you think is contributing to these disparities? And I know that um, in a couple of bullets below that, it was mentioning that in acute wounds, um, that it's related to acute stress. And so do you think that maybe chronic wounds would be related to like a chronic stress or some type of ongoing stressor that's happening? Like, what do you think is maybe happening there? All right, well, that's about eight questions, Leticia. So we'll start at the beginning. <laughs> okay. um, the, number one, um, uh, communities of color and communities of lower, and, and again, communities of color and uh, populations where there's socioeconomic distrust or uh, dis, uh, uh, disconnect, mm -hmm. their diets are different. And I know Liz can talk about that. Their diets are different. Their protein, protein's expensive, carbs are cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, what's in fast foods, carbs. Why is it fast? Because carbs are cheap. French fries are cheaper than a hamburger. And even though the hamburger contains some protein, it's not enough. And because the, the socioeconomic impact on uh, communities of color and communities uh, of underserved communities in terms of socioeconomic economic static, that actually does put them at risk. Uh, and there are actually uh, known differences in uh, the integument of people of color with regard to the various components and structure, especially when we get to collagen. There's actually scientific evidence that collagen is different. Um, so that may or may not, may or may not lead them to, to the potential risk of chronicity, but the question then is, if there's a difference in the collagen amount in uh, skin of color, which there is, that's scientifically proven, it's a little different kind of collagen. It's, it's, it's based on genetic predisposition, based on environmental issues historically. Well, what the role is, what's that role in regard to the socioeconomic economic status with regard to the reduction of protein intake compared to populations that are higher protein intake. I don't know the answer to that, but certainly that opens that for opens it for questioning. And as far as stress, that's that's true universally. Mm -hmm. uh, stress will reduce wound healing, and the way it does that, because in a stress environment, especially with pain, uh, we actually secrete more epinephrine and vasoactive chemicals, which cause vasoconstriction. And even though it may be limited. It's if a patient already is predisposed to a chronic wound for some other reason, and now they're under significant stress, that will impact that wound healing uh, and make it make it more problematic simply because of vascular inflow, for example. Um, and also it alters intake and diet, uh, causes uh, different kinds of responses in terms of the dietary intake. Um, I, I get frustrated, I'm gonna go eat a pint of ice cream instead of uh, you know, eating eating the appropriate plate that that Liz is talking about, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did, um, I do have. A, if I don't know if Liz, if you had any um, response to that, I also have another question in the chat. Um, uh, no, the only response, and this is just me speculating. I think there's so much we're learning recently about chronic inflammation. Yes. Um, related. And if you think about comorbidities, I think um, chronic inflammation could be tied to chronic wounds and non healing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and, think in that's fact, many, many chronic wounds are stuck in the inflammatory phase. Mm -hmm. Now, there's lots of reasons for that, but stress is certainly part of that. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I've got one more question. Uh, after. After attending several wound care conferences, I have noticed that Juven has had popularity as a supplement for individuals with wounds. What is your take on having Juven in formulary? And would you recommend any other supplements? I'll start with that. And Alan, <laughs> you can jump in if you want. Um, I have anecdotally seen Juven work. It does not work for everybody. Um, I am an advocate of food first, but having a broad formulary that will, um, different things can be tried on different people because people respond differently. So, you know, I think that's between the facility, hospital, post-acute care, whatever, staff and uh, directors of nursing and dietitians and um, medical director. I mean, I'm not gonna 
sit here and say, this is what you should have in your formulary. That's a, a facility decision. Yeah, yeah and I, I thoroughly agree with that. And, and, and I, the last, uh, whatever it is, years that I was medical director at Unity Point, it is in our formulary. Um, how often it's prescribed, I really don't know. Uh, I know that a, a number of the nursing facilities and long-term care facilities use it, uh, which is an interesting because it's not cheap. Uh, and Iowa State is where it was developed. So I come from that, that community. There's an interesting story about what it was originally developed for, and that's for another day, but not for what it's being used. Um, it's, not, it's not deleterious. It isn't going to harm the patient. So, you know, again, am I a believer in using it? I don't know what that means. It's not a religion. This is science. <laughs> but at the end of the day, whatever works, as long as it isn't going to hurt the patient. The problem we have, though, is that's sort of unabashed, and it doesn't help us move forward in terms of how we're going to deal with these problems, because we're just picking things off the shelf. It's my hope and, and my belief that as we move forward and we understand more of what's going on in the biochemistry of a wound, especially chronic wounds, then we may wind up understanding that we need more glutamine, we need more arginine. These patients wind up having a disconnect somewhere, especially in the inflammatory phase of wound healing, and therefore Juven is a good thing, or even arginate, which I'm not a big promo promoter of. But we always have to remember the, the two most common amino acids are in that supplement. It's not that we're deficient, that's not the issue. It may be the delivery, it may be how it gets into the, into the wound environment, that may be the issue. And over or increasing the supplementation may have an effect in certain patients, and that is observed. And that may be, that's something we need to understand why in those patients and not the others. And also, if I understand it correctly, in, in order for Juven to work as it says it does, a person needs to have adequate calories and protein to begin with. So you can't just give it to someone who's not eating anything and expect it to work miracles. Yeah. It's, it's and, and, yeah, and that's very important, Liz, and I'm glad you said that. It's a, a supplement, it's not a substitute. None of these things are substitutes. They're all supplements. The first and most important thing is an adequate diet with appropriate amount of calories and the appropriate protein intake, the appropriate micronutrient intake. And then where do supplements fit? That's, that's where the science needs to go. I'll say thank you so much um, to both of you for an exciting uh, discussion. And thank you to everyone who put questions in the q and I'll say we're going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bogey to close us out. Great. Well, thank you. This is obviously a, a, an action-packed seminar. Lots, lots <laughs> to cover. <laughs> uh, and probably generate more questions than answers. Um, but... I would like to thank everybody for attending this final um, webinar in the Chronicles of Wound Theme Investigation Series for 2022. Uh, it's been brought to you by the Wound Healing Society Education Committee and Wound Healing U. As a reminder, the recording will be available in your member only account on the Wound Healing U in the next few weeks. And uh, we now ask, uh, as we close out uh, this second series of webinars, that you complete some brief questions to help us continue to provide content that is of interest to WH members, WHS members, and uh, we'll be back in the spring. Thank you. Bye everybody. <laughs>